Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Katie Castagna. I'm the president and CEO for United Way Monterey County. I'm so pleased to be welcoming you all to our first ever accessory dwelling unit conference. United Way fights for the financial stability of everybody in Monterey County. And we know that we cannot do this without expanding access to affordable housing. We need more housing in order to win this fight for financial stability. One of the key strategies that's been gaining a lot of interest in recent years is accessory dwelling units. Wanting to expand our local knowledge, we had partnered with the American Institute of Architects Monterey Bay chapter to create this conference. I wanna thank Peter Casavan for making this happen. When he first called me with the idea of bringing ADU expert Cole Peterson to town, we hoped it would be in, in person. But as shelter in place wore on, we realized we didn't wanna wait. In fact, we've learned that by doing this virtually, we've created new opportunities for attendance and access. The concept quickly gained momentum with enrollment far exceeding our expectations. We have nearly 200 people registered just for this session alone. I'd like to thank our sponsors that make this possible today, including Casavan Architects, Monterey County Association of Realtors, Casavan Construction, Studio Chicatans, Justin Polly Architects, the Association for Monterey Bay Area Governments, the City of Pacific Grove, Monterey Energy Group, CHISPA, the Paul Davis Partnership, Workbench, City of Seaside, City of Salinas, City of Gonzales, the Salinas Valley Chamber of Commerce, the Central Coast Builders Association, the Monterey County Farm Bureau, the City of Monterey, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, and the Carmel Chamber of Commerce. As I said, you can see there's quite a lot of interest in this topic. And now I would like to introduce Doug Yaunt, Project Director for Marina Community Partners, and he's the Chair of the Board for United Way in Monterey County. Thank you, Katie. Good afternoon. As you heard from Katie, here in Monterey County, United Way's primary mission is to improve the quality of life for families by ensuring their financial stability. This mission is especially important in these economically challenging times where families' daily lives, the businesses where they work, the schools they attend are all stretched to their limits with the pandemic, the fires, in addition to the normal struggle these families have. The mission for financial stability is accomplished through three key focus areas for United Way, derived from a countywide strategic process of the community impact model. There are three areas of focus are, one, affordable child care and early childhood education, financial literacy and asset building, and importantly, affordable housing. ADUs are a key component of affordable housing, often overlooked in their importance and ability to fulfill housing goals for local communities and the region. I am pleased Monterey County, like the state, is now recognizing this strategic component of affordable housing. I'm also pleased that the United Way is helping to facilitate this regional conversation to catalyze the increase in this important portion of the housing supply. Let me now introduce a prominent local architect, Peter Casavan. Peter and I had the pleasure of working together in the not too distant past with the city of Salinas on their award-winning economic development element of the general plan. And it was a real pleasure working with someone of Peter's expertise. Peter is a third generation Monterey County resident and the president of the Casavan Architects founded in Salinas in 1949 by his father. Peter bought the company in 1994 and has been responsible for many award-winning buildings, including the center for performing arts at the Carmel High School and the Ted Taylor Ag Vocational Center at Rancho Cielo. He was invested as a fellow in the American Institute of Architects in 2017 and serves as the chair of the Intergovernmental for the Governmental Affairs Committee for the AIA Monterey Bay Chapter. So, Peter. Thank you, Doug. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, and I have fond memories of our work together on the EDE. Um, am I on? Can everybody hear me? I'm not getting much feedback, but I'm going to continue. The American Institute of Architects, known as the AIA, has been advancing the value of architecture for more than 150 years. 
with 100 members, the Monterey Bay chapter serves the tri-county area as the regional voice for, our, for the architectural profession. We serve as an educational resource to promote the quality of the built environment and to advocate policies to create prosperous, healthy, and livable communities. We are proud to be co-sponsoring this series of four workshops with the United Way Monterey County. The planning and building permit review process can cause unneeded delays and unanticipated costs. The AIA advocates for legislation and policies that streamline the permit review process. In the case of ADUs, that includes recent state legislation that relieves homeowners of many expensive local requirements and eliminates development fees for most ADUs. These laws also require local jurisdictions to include a plan that incentivizes and promotes the creation of accessory dwelling units. The members of the AIA Monterey Bay understand local zoning ordinances, building codes, and state laws that will affect the creation of your ADU. Our training experience will not only help you negotiate this permit process, but help you develop a realistic budget and schedule and assist you in your selection of a qualified building contractor. Our members have been recognized with hundreds of design awards and we can provide you with beautiful designs that maximize the livability, efficiency, and durability of your project within your available resources. You can find a list of member architects at the AIA MB website. Just simply type in AIA MB to take you there. So thank you for supporting our workshops. I know you'll find this presentation to be a great resource as you consider the value of pursuing an ADU project. At this point, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. The Honorable Chris Lopez is the chair of the Monterey County Board of Supervisor representing District 1 in South County. Mr. Lopez was born and raised in King City in Southern Monterey County. He earned a degree in international relations and economics from Claremont McKenna College and spent time interning in Hong Kong and in the office of the governor of Guanajuato, Mexico. Chris returned to the Salinas Valley and interned for District 1 Supervisor Simone Salinas and was promoted to his chief of staff serving in that position for seven and a half years. When Simone retired, Supervisor Lopez won his seat on the board in a contested race, taking office in January 2019. Now think about it, that was just over a year and a half ago. Uh, and he has already shown great leadership guiding the residents of Monterey County through one of the most eventful years in county history. He's effectively guided this county during the historic events of 2020 with multiple challenges of pandemic shutdowns and three major wildflowers, wildfires, including the enormous river fire, which directly affected his constituents. I'm honored this time to introduce Supervisor Chris Lopez. Thank you, Peter. And thank you all for having me today, you know, sitting on this panel and being able to participate and give you a welcome today gives me great honor. And one of the reasons that I'm here today is because just yesterday, our county actually passed our ordinances to come into line with new state policies. And it's not something that was an easy lift, but it's something that was critically important. And I was proud to champion those efforts because like all of you on this call today, for me, ADUs were something personal. I went through the process. I built an ADU that was completed just this last year. Uh, in actually February of 2020, we got our occupancy permit, uh, which allowed our my in-laws to move in on our property here in Greenfield. And going through that process, I saw the struggles, I saw the challenges, and realized that for me, this was something that we needed to change as local government to make more accessible for our families. And so with us on, at the helm of this sort of effort in Monterey County, we've streamlined the process, creating a very simple sort of layout of junior ADU, ADUs up from 800 to 1100 square feet, uh, as well as some unique uh, sort of opportunities for those people who are in resource constricted areas. Uh, the gr presentation yesterday from staff was wonderful. And so since we had the first reading, the ordinance will go into effect in 30 days. Uh, those rules are critical. They help make the process here in Monterey County easier for each one of you who's interested in investing in our community. And for us, what Katie said was correct. It's not just housing. Housing is the start of everything that happens in our community. It gives people comfort, it gives people a place to recover, and it gives us as a community opportunity. Housing is the basis of everything that we're able to accomplish as a community. And I wanna thank you all for being here, for spending the time to learn about the process, to learn about the challenges, but more importantly, for being interested in this opportunity to be part of the solution for all of Monterey County. 
I know it's it's not an easy thing to take on, but for all of us around the table, we want to make it as easy as possible. So if you have questions, please raise them. We're not done with the process. In fact, yesterday at our board, the way we ended our conversation was talking about incentives. How do we make it even easier now that we have a streamlined process for people to build ADUs here in the unincorporated areas of Monterey County? As leaders in this effort here locally, we look forward to being your partner in solutions. And for me, it was bringing my in-laws on site, which is on-site childcare, which in the end is a home that they can age in place in, making it easier with no steps, ramps, and all that forethought that incredible architects like Peter have brought to the front end now that we get to consider and make sure that our communities are living better, living longer, aging in place. There's a lot of opportunities in ADUs. So thank you for your interest. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to the dialogue. I will stick with you through this hearing as I, I learn about the new efforts that others are putting forward because together we can move mountains. And for some, all that takes is an ADU. For some families, an ADU is that mountain that they can't get over. And in the efforts that we're all putting forward together, we will get through this uh, and be able to change the world that we live in here in Monterey County. So thank you for having an interest in being part of the solution. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you. And with that, I wanna turn it back to Katie and once again say thank you for the opportunity and thank you for being a partner. Thank you so much, Supervisor Lopez. We're so grateful to have you here kicking off the ADU conference with us today. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Kelly DeWolf and I'm the Impact Associate for Affordable Housing here at United Way, Monterey County. And we're so excited to have Cole Peterson here with us today to lead this workshop series. Cole is an ADU expert based in Portland, Oregon, who has helped catalyze the exponential growth of ADUs in Portland over the last decade through ADU advocacy, education, consulting, policy work, and entrepreneurship. He's the author of Backdoor Revolution, The Definitive Guide to ADU Development. He's the owner of Caravan, the first tiny house hotel in the world, and the organizer of Portland's popular ADU tour. He consults with homeowners about ADUs on their property and teaches ADU classes for homeowners and for real estate agents in Oregon, Washington, and California. He edits and manages several websites on ADUs, including accessorydwellings.org and buildinganadu.com. Cole developed and lived in a detached new construction ADU in 2011 and developed a basement slash garage conversion ADU in 2018. He has a master's degree in environmental planning from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Prior to his ADU work, Cole worked in the federal government for 10 years in Washington, D.C. and Portland, Oregon. Um, before I introduce Cole, I just want to let um, all the participants know that starting now and going on through the rest of the workshop, um, if you could please place your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Our moderators will field your questions and share them with Cole during the Q&A portion of the workshop. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Cole um, for you to take it away. Thank you, Cole. All right. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I think Kelly, you need to stop sharing your screen. Okay, cool. All right. So, hey, everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I am going to try to share my screen here and just kind of talk for a few minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, just I, I just want to say to start, um, thank you so much for uh, participating today. Today is the first day of four workshops that are listed down here below. Um, ultimately, though, if you are a homeowner who's building an ADU, you're kind of the, you, you are where the rubber meets the road and you are the people that we want to reach um, with this information. So um, we really appreciate you coming here. And this is what I do. I, I, I love to teach homeowners about ADUs because I believe in this um, form of housing so much, and it's ultimately done in a distributed manner by each and every one of you. And, um, and so our goal is to equip you with the knowledge, information, skill sets that you need to become homeowner developers of ADUs on your property. Um, thank you so much to AIA, United Way, 
Kossaman Architects and all the other sponsors that were here um, to support this event. Uh, Kelly gave me a good introduction, so I'm just going to hit on a couple other things. I also run an, a workshop called ADU Academy, which is for professionals who are interested in developing ADUs on their property. I'm sorry, professionals who are interested in assisting homeowners who want to build ADUs. I also have a ADU specialist designation that I run with a partner organization that's for professionals. I do consulting for city states and, and other organizations about ADUs and now pretty involved in some policy, heavily, heavily involved in policy work about middle housing, which is more on the um, trajectory of uh, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, cottage clusters, townhouse development regulations, which is kind of an up and coming trend following on the heels of the success of ADUs uh, along the West Coast, largely thanks in part to the California legislation that we'll be covering here today. Um, so today's workshop, I also want to say, boy, what a weird time. I'm here in Portland, Oregon. It's uh, quite uh, difficult to go outside because of the smoke and um, we are in, in a um, very odd time and I just want to recognize that. I'm sure everybody feels the same. Um, amazingly, ADUs are kind of this, as a colleague from Atlanta says, they're kind of the Swiss army knife of housing. They do so many things so subtly. Um, and so in the face of coronavirus pandemic and in the face of wildfire smoke craziness, ADUs still make so much sense, uh, specifically for those, you know, to address those issues. Um, they're pretty amazing. Um, and I can go off on tangents in a number of different ways. I won't do that today, but, but you know, um, well, I will for a second, because I like to do this. So, like, let's take the coronavirus pandemic. So all of a sudden, there's all this interest in multi-generational housing to give family members a place to live without going to assisted living. Um, and that is all the more salient now as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, there's also a need for new jobs uh, in the economy because a lot of people are going to be going out of work. And the residential building sector is a huge sector that has a lot more potential. And um, so I'm really interested in kind of helping that local cottage industry uh, flourish. Um, and so I think there, there needs to be a lot more people in the construction trades doing this kind of work, and that's, that's important stuff. Um, so um, anyway, there's, there's also the fact that we need a lot of additional new housing now because a lot of homes are burning, uh, and ADUs are one way to potentially do that better than quicker and cheaper for, than other types of housing that are out there. In any case, I'm going to move on from that um, and uh, just talk about, you know, today's workshop is going to be framed in these, uh, using this agenda, uh, policy, zoning regulations, costs, property taxes, financing, infrastructure, um, and the step-by-step -step design build process and further resources. So um, we'll try to uh, leave some time for questions and I'll probably try to see whether we can maybe get some questions built in after some sections. So maybe uh, Kelly and others, you know, we'll plan on doing a couple breaks to take some questions that are pertinent to the sections that I just covered. Um, so that's how we'll do it today. Um, all right. And I should mention I'm developed and lived, uh, developed a basement conversion ADU, which is where I am right now in a basement conversion ADU. So what is an ADU? An ADU is a secondary housing unit on a single family lot, which is a simple definition, but I want to blow that definition up a little bit because it's actually a little bit more complicated than what you might think. So secondary housing unit. So the conventional traditional definition of a, of a ADU is that it's a secondary housing unit. But in fact, now with California legislation and what's happening in Seattle and Portland and Vancouver, BC, which are all like the leaders of ADU uh, development activity, um, they all allow two ADUs. So it's not just a secondary uh, dwelling unit anymore. Um, you can actually have two ADUs and we'll go into more about that in a minute. Um, and I'll try to provide clarification when we get to that section on what I mean by that. 
uh, secondary housing unit, single family lot. So these are allowed on, on single family lots. They're actually allowed on different zoned lots as well. Like if you have a primary residential dwelling on a commercially zoned piece of property, you could also have an ADU there. That would be acceptable, permissible. Um, what is a housing unit? Well, a housing unit is conventionally defined as a space with independent kitchen, living, dining, uh, and uh, sanitation space. But what differentiates a housing unit from other uh, habitable living space that you could have on your property is actually the kitchen sink and stove connection. So if you were to walk into this basement unit ADU here and see this stove and a kitchen sink, um, those are the things that actually define it as being a housing unit that is distinct from and different from just additional habitable living space. If you built out your basement and it had an extra bedroom, an extra bathroom, an extra entrance, that's not an ADU. That is just additional habitable living space. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. That's all good. You can rent it out legally. That's cool. Um, it's only when you add that kitchen sink and stove that the building code officials say, aha, that's an ADU. You have to have it permitted as an ADU. Um, and then it's an independent in theory, it should theoretically be permitted as an independent housing unit. And by extension, there's a number of other regulatory triggers that that results in, such as separation of utilities, which we'll talk about later. Um, but, but that's kind of, I think it's important to understand uh, some of the nuance of property development to know that there's nothing wrong with building out additional space on your property and not calling it an ADU. And furthermore, you can legally rent out a bedroom in your house and you can legally rent out a basement bedroom in your house. And as a loophole, you know, sometimes I'll talk to jurisdictions where they don't allow ADUs and I'm like, don't worry about it. Just build a detached accessory structure that can have habitable living space, a bedroom, a bathroom, a separate entrance. And you just can't put in a legal kitchen sink and stove, but you can put in legally a 110 outlet connection, which has a hop, you can plug in a hot plate legally, with, since it's okay to do that. You can put in a refrigerator, you can put in a microwave, you can put in a convection oven, none of which trigger it being an ADU. So it's a significant way to actually produce something that looks and quacks like a duck, but it isn't classified as a duck. But that's not really a factor in California anywhere because you can do ADUs by right. And if you're gonna build something that looks like a duck and acts like a duck, call it a duck. Um, in this case, we have a detached new construction ADU in the upper left-hand corner, a basement conversion ADU in the upper right-hand corner, and a garage conversion ADU in the lower portion of this image. There's other structural forms of ADUs that are out there as well. ADUs above a garage, sometimes called a carriage house. I'm sorry about the yappy dogs. Um, ADUs above a garage, you can do a bump out addition ADUs as well. But in what, what in reality, what we see, the most common form of ADU that you're gonna see in most places are gonna be detached new construction ADUs. So um, this is the quintessential life cycle of an ADU that shows this nuclear family living in a ADU in 2010 and they move, um, give me one second. Um, I am going to, just take care of something on my end. Apologize about that. All right, so um, this nuclear family is living in this property, the yellow house in the front. Bill has an ADU in, in 2010 and they're renting it out. They're renting out the, the brownish house in the back. 2020, they become a nuclear family with 2.3 kids. They move into both the ADU and the primary house because they have a big family. Teenage daughter no longer wants to be in the same dwelling as their parents because she wants to have parties. And then 2040, the, the kids go off to school, parents become empty nesters, kids, uh, parents move into the 
ADU start renting out the, the primary house in the front. So this, this, this slide kind of shows some of the quintessential uh, benefits or motivations that people have of why they might want to build an ADU. And it also shows some other interesting things that I want to spend some time thinking about. So <clears throat> number one, we know from a study that was done in Oregon, the first kind of uh, per study of permitted ADUs that um, in 2013, that the number one motivation of why people actually are building ADUs is passive rental income potential. The second most common motivation is multi-generational household flexibility. So it's usually like a combination of those two factors that are motivating most people to build ADUs. Um, but the other interesting thing that I want to point out here is that this family is opting to live on this property for 30 years. The average American household is living on their property for like five to seven years. And so we don't actually know for a fact that people who build ADUs are living on their property for 30 years. That's just something that was illustrated in this, in this slide coincidentally. But I think it's fair to say that it's possible that by building an ADU, it's likely to induce people to live or at least own that property for a much longer period of time because it provides this built-in flexibility that they wouldn't otherwise have. For example, if you did not have an accessible house and you wanted to stay in your neighborhood, you could build an ADU to be accessible so that you can move into it when you get older and, um, <clears throat> and that gives you a, an opportunity to stay in your neighborhood. It also is something where once you've built an ADU, which is a really expensive uh, endeavor up front, your motivation for selling that property will go down in part because the ADU is going to cost so much to build. And it's not necessarily going to add as much value as it costs to construct. Um, and so while that might seem like an irrational uh, investment at, at, at initially, it becomes more and more rational the more you hold on to the property. The longer you hold on to the property, the better the return is in, in the sense that the ADU will eventually pay for itself via the rental income that you get from it if you're renting it out. So one of the reasons that I am especially passionate about ADUs is that I Um, angle and specifically kind of a greenhouse gas emissions reduction angle. And while I don't know that this is requisite for um, people to get excited about, I think it's worth noting because it's important. Um, and in the California context, this isn't something that's broadly known or thought about. People are always thinking about ADUs as an affordable housing solution, which is fine. And it is in some ways, and we can talk about that. We will talk about that in subsequent workshops. But the the thing that jazzes me about ADUs as a, as, a, as a environmental guy is that if you are building an average sized house, 2,200 square feet to code, which is the least possible aggressive standard to which you can build a house, and then you build that same house to high performance standards, that is to say a really good air ceiling with good insulation, that, that, that house will use less emissions and that's great. But if you simply reduce the size of the structure from the average size house to the largest possible ADU you can do in the Portland context, you know, roughly 800 square feet, um, that ADU will outperform this large sized house that's built to a high performance green building standard. So just by virtue of the fact that you're building a small dwelling, you're necessarily building a high performance home in that the biggest use of energy of your house is the heating and cooling of that volumetric space within the structure. And as a result, simply reducing the size of the structure is the most significant way you can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that structure. So as much as all these lead standards and green building standards, think about the building shell and solar panels and all this stuff, what's more important in many ways is simply reducing uh, <laughs> uh, the size of the structure itself. And so if you build that ADU to high performance standards, um, it will use fewer emissions still. And so that's a good thing. But the important thing is that you're building it small to begin with, and you're required to build an ADU to be small because ADUs are inherently required to be small by code. So um, uh, that is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of ADUs because they are gonna be a high performance, high efficiency greenhouse gas uh, reducing type type of dwelling option um, in that if you are building if you're living in a 
um, if you're if there's five people living in a 2200 square foot house, they will use less energy per capita than one person living in an ADU. Um, so that is a true statement. However, most people are living in one and two person households. So um, what we're seeing is a lot of people living uh, in one and two person households in these 2200 square foot homes. And so they're using a lot of emissions per capita, whereas a one and two person household living in an ADU, is, are, they're going to use fewer emissions. So we're not necessarily going to be changing household sizes uh, to increase. In fact, we're going the opposite way. Um, and I'll show you some evidence to that, to support that statement here. Um, so in the 1900s, we did in fact have a lot of five plus person households. and We had very few one person households, but that has changed over time. And as you can see, one and two person households are on the rise. They have been for nearly a hundred years or over a hundred years actually. Um, meanwhile, uh, five person, five, five plus person, plus person households are kind of a, a declining demographic for a variety of reasons. And so if you look at that change in household size uh, just as a single metric, uh, the average household size in 1940 was 3.6. It's shrunk down to uh, 2.6 over the last 50 years. And um, if you look at the per the size of dwelling units over time, and you contrast that with the per capita households or the household sizes, um, the end result is we are dramatically ballooning our per capita square footage over time. We are building bigger homes and we're decreasing our household sizes. Um, why are we decreasing our household sizes? Well, um, there's a number of different variables there, but uh, there's a lot of married couples with uh, that are that are not having children. There's a lot of unrelated people living together, single people living alone, and single people with children. Um, there, there, the people are also living longer, and as a result, um, what happens is as you live in live, you know, an extra 20 years more than you did in the early 1900s, that means that. 20 more years more of your life, you're not living with kids in the house. So the single biggest demographic of new households are um, kind of the baby boomer generation, uh, one and two person households that are forming. So there's just a lot of different variables that are creating uh, a lot more housing demand for one and two person households than we used to have. So even if the population wasn't growing in your jurisdiction, which it is, you would nonetheless need more homes to accommodate that same population size as a result of shrinking household sizes. And so this plays into the larger discussion of middle housing, which I'll allude to, but not really focus on today. Um, so there's still married couples with children, nuclear family households, but it's just not that significant of a demographic anymore relative to what it was in the 1950s. It's roughly a quarter to a third of households, according to the census, pretty much nationwide. Um, Meanwhile, if you look at the kind of housing we're building in the United States, three, uh, roughly three quarters of the homes that are being built are in fact these three bedroom, four bedroom homes that are designed for the 1950s. They're designed for these nuclear families with five people in them, which we no longer really have. Um, so there's a really diametrically polarized mismatch between the housing production and the uh, household ho housing demographic demand for housing. Um, so there's some, there's some single family attached townhouses, row houses being built, and then there's some multifamily construction happening. But really, this is the single family residential dwelling construction is the dominant form of development in the United States, you know, nationwide. So a lot of those factors have resulted in the fact that people are building ADUs, whether they were legal or not. And... Um, Till recently, they pretty much were essentially illegal in most of the country. Um, uh, if not illegal, the regulations for them were so bad that nobody in their right mind would want to build one. And that includes probably every jurisdiction that's, you know, everybody's on the call today. You're probably in a jurisdiction where the code was not very good and therefore very few ADs would ever have been built. But all of that has changed. Um, so let's spend a minute here talking about unpermitted versus permitted ADUs. Why might people build unpermitted ADUs even in the, even in the context of having uh, really good regulations, which arguably California has at this point, and we'll be talking about that next. Um, so 
What are the cons of going through the permitting process? Well, it's a lengthy bureaucratic process conventionally to build anything period with permits. Um, it's more expensive to comply with building code than not to, and your taxes will go up if you build something with permits. Um, what are the pros of permitting an ADU? Well, if you permit the ADU, your appraised value can go up. So that means that if an appraiser comes into the property, they can say, oh yeah, you have a viable legal addition here with an ADU. And that means that your home value has gone up and therefore you can access a home equity line of credit that is bigger than it used to be, or you can do a refinance based on the new value of the home. Or it means that a future home buyer can come in and say, oh yeah, you built an ADU, so I'm willing to pay an extra $100,000 and the appraiser will say, yep, that home's worth an extra $100,000. Whereas if it's an unpermitted ADU, that might not be the case. It means that you as a homeowner can rent out that ADU without any stress, because it's legal to do it. You can get insurance on the unit with no problem. One phone call to the insurance provider and you have insurance 500 bucks a year or so for the additional homeowner's insurance for that additional unit. And by virtue of going through the permitting process, you're gonna get a degree of quality assurance that you wouldn't otherwise get with an unpermitted ADU. Uh, that is to say, you are going to have to go through a planning zoning process and a building uh, inspection process. And those two things in, in concert with one another will ensure that you're at least building it to a degree of, you know, a standard that is deemed acceptable by the building officials. So there's a degree of quality assurance, which is a good thing um, because building a, a house is no simple task and it's there's a lot to it. So ensuring that we're doing it right is important. Um, so I'm gonna break there and just check in with the uh, Q and A's, make sure, see if there's any Q and A's that I should answer right now. And I will ask um, maybe Kelly to chime in if she thinks there's any questions that I should address before I move on. I'll be getting into regulations next. Yeah, cool. Um, here's a question for you. Has anyone ever studied the additional positive impact on the local economy of building ADUs compared to larger scale multi-unit construction projects? Um, building ADUs means employment of small scale local architects, contractors, and subcontractors, and that might be a benefit, for example. Yeah, I think that's a really good observation and question. Um, I don't think there, I'm not aware of a study to that effect, but I can say as a, somebody who has vast amounts of, of firsthand experience with uh, the cottage industry, which spans, you know, designers, builders, lenders, realtors, appraisers, and many others. In fact, it is true without a doubt that this is definitely a way to spur a cottage industry, small business type of uh, development as opposed to a large multifamily structure. I'm not going to throw small, large multifamily structures under the bus by any extent, but I will say that there is a, an inherently, ADUs do lend themselves to being a very good enterprise for one person general contractors, one person design shops. So I think it's fair to say without data to back it up that that is a true statement. And that's one of the thousands of reasons that I think ADUs are really cool because uh, they foster this kind of local grassroots uh, cottage industry type of development. And so that's one of the reasons why I think they're great. I think they're also great for the individual's local, you know, the individual homeowner developer's pocketbook too. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so we're gonna dive into the regulations now. Um, and I wanted to just start this component to say that what I'm about to cover is the essentially the, the way that I understand the new California ADU regulations to be. Um, and I say that caveat because there is a lot of confusion statewide about the California ADU regulations because it's new, it's, it's fairly complex, and it's so new, in fact, that I just got my hands on the official guidance today that is available from the California Department of Housing and Community Development informally from a colleague, and it's not even available on their own website. This is how new the California ADU regulations are. So bear with me if I make mistakes, you know, hopefully somebody will correct me. Um, and if they correct me, they might be wrong because there's a lot of confusion um, about these, some of these, the nuanced questions that might come up. Um, so, you know, 
I might just say, I don't know the answer to your question. Good question though. And have you, you know, punt it to a local official to try to answer as best they can and they might not know, but I'll do my best to kind of filter the information that's available um, through the California, you know, HCD, how, uh, California's Housing and Community Development and filter down to a practical level for the average homeowner. And so here we go. There are different forms of ADUs that we've talked about already. There's detached ADUs, internal conversion ADUs, uh, which are a portion of your primary dwelling. There's garage conversion ADUs and there's attached bump out ADUs. Um, and some of the changes that have occurred uh, statewide that apply in Monterey and Salinas and the county of Monterey as well um, are that the rear and side yard setbacks have now been reduced to four feet. That means that your foundation has to be four feet from the property line, no less. Um, uh, and um, so single family homes, as I mentioned before, uh, can actually have two ADUs. One is classified, one, one must be a junior ADU, one is an ADU, and we'll talk more about junior ADUs momentarily. Um, but effectively, you know, for lack of a, without going into too much detail, it's fair to say as a general matter, you can actually have two ADUs on a property throughout California statewide. And that's ministerial, which means you can do it by right under certain conditions that you have to follow. Um, cities will require a minimum six foot separation between uh, the ADU and another structure for fire safety. Typically, it might be as much as 10 feet in Monterey. I don't know, maybe we can get clarification from somebody uh, at the planning department in Monterey by the question and answer um, function about that. Um, so some, some size threshold considerations that are a little bit uh, interesting and, and um, worth considering are this. So if you're building an ADU, the best size to build to is 750 square feet. And I say the best size because if you build it under 750 square feet, you're gonna avoid paying impact fees. Um, and so I'm not sure how much impact fees are in the city of Monterey, but they're probably not insignificant. Um, and so just being able to avoid those impact fees is a nice thing. Um, if you build up to 800 square feet, um, your setback, lock coverage, floor area ratios, and minimum open size spaces are all waived. Um, and, uh, but you might have to pay impact fees at that point. Um, if you build a one bedroom ADU, you can build up to 850 square feet by right. Um, you therefore must, at that point, at that threshold, must meet all zoning requirements such as setback standard, lot coverage, which might be, uh, you know, different than the four foot setback standard, uh, um, lot coverage, floor area ratio, and minimum open space requirements. And then if you're building um, a two bedroom ADU, it can be up to 1,000 square feet. So there's some, um, you know, nuance uh, to each of these uh, size thresholds, but as a general matter, it's probably fair to say if you build less than 750 square feet, that's probably the best size to build to. But um, but you can build up to a thousand square feet if it's a two better medium. Um, so that's an option. Um, we'll get more into why that might not be a viable option for you in a, in a slide or two here. So let's move on to junior ADUs. Um, junior ADUs is this kind of concept that is only in California. Um, it's no, in, not in any other states, but it's, a, it's an interesting concept that should in theory be a less expensive form of ADU to develop. It's, it's, it's classified as an ADU that's within the footprint of the primary house. Um, and so it's effectively an internal carve out ADU. Now that internal carve out ADU could be with, housed within the structural envelope of the building, the primary building, and that could include an attached garage. And so that's really, I think what the legislator's intent was, was, hey, there's a lot of attached garages out there. Um, and so we, you know, may, maybe people will be interested in, in converting attached garages. And there's a lot of good reason to think that converting a, an ex, a pre existing permitted structure is in fact a really good policy agenda for legislators in that that is the least expensive form of ADU to develop. And furthermore, if you build one of these junior ADUs, which is, again, a little bit of a nuanced form of dwelling, it, it doesn't actually have to have its own uh, bathroom, which is kind of weird. So 
And that way it's not really what I would say is a normal ADU, but it can have its own bathroom. So you could have your own bathroom in your 500 square foot attached internal carve out ADU. And you could also have, um, you, it has to have its own kitchenette. Um, it has to have its own entry. Um, uh, some cities might require fire separation between the two units. That is to say two layers of five eighths inch drywall and it might have to have a separate HVAC system. Um, typically ADUs are compelled to have their own um, independent heating controls and uh, electrical controls. There might be some variation for that, though some exceptions for that within the junior ADU form. Um, but this, you know, this is a, it's definitely a, a, an option to, to keep an eye out for on your property. But if it was me, I'd probably just kind of call it an ADU instead of a junior ADU in most contexts. And I think by and large, that will be the case throughout California. We will not see vast numbers of these junior ADUs, um, although that would be great if we did. I mean, maybe I'll be wrong about that. So I alluded to the fact that you might not be able to build a thousand square foot ADU on your property. And that's because the height standard for ADUs in all jurisdictions in Monterey area are, is 16 feet. And so um, you could in theory build a 16 square, a 16 foot tall structure measured at the peak of the roof, that's a thousand square feet. But in practice, you'd find that that would eat up so much of your backyard that you probably wouldn't want to do it unless you're on a really big lot. So if you're on like a 10,000 square foot lot or bigger, sure, you could build a two, you know, a two bedroom, 1,000 square foot ADU in that context. But if we're talking about most lots that are 5,000, 6,000, less than 5,000 square feet, you're not going to be building um, a thousand square foot ADU. It wouldn't. It wouldn't really fit on your property. Um, so it's it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to fit two stories under a 16 foot height limit. In theory, you could make a subterranean first floor, so you walk down, and the actual height of the structure is 16 feet. But that's going to cost so much. You wouldn't want to do that. Um, so this 16 foot height limit um, as a different matter is something that I would like to see change statewide to allow for two stories for a host of reasons that I can talk about on another day, but I'll leave that for another day. But I just want to make the point that in fact, like cities like Los Angeles, which has vastly more ADUs than, than any other city in the, in the country, allow for two ADUs and it's not an accident that that's the case. Um, that is a very important uh, change that could be made within um, any jurisdiction if they chose to, to allow for two-story ADUs and it enables a lot more ADU development. Um, it, just, a, just as a reference point in Portland, like something like a third of all ADUs are two-story ADUs, so it's, it's very common here. Um, and that's because it doesn't eat up so much of the backyard um, effectively. So that, all, all that said, I did want to mention there is a, you know, a loophole here that I think it's worth noting, which is that if you build an attached ADU, attached bump out ADU, you take your primary house and you build it on an attached uh, unit to it, then you can go up two stories. You can build up to the underlying zoning base height standards of that jurisdiction, which are 30 feet in Monterey County and, and the city of Salinas and 25 feet in, uh, in the city of Monterey and 24 feet in Seaside, I think. So effectively, any of those height standards, you can build two stories. So if you build an attached unit, if you really need to be efficient with your land, say you have a small-ish lot, 4,000 square feet, you need to go two stories in, or in order to accommodate a, say, 800 square foot ADU or 900 square foot ADU. Um, really, the only realistic way to do that without entirely eating up your backyard would be to build an attached ADU. So, I think this is something that people should be aware of if they uh, start to run up against that issue of, hey, I'm on a small lot, but I need a bigger ADU. Figure out a way to attach it. And, um, you know, while I call it a loophole, it's not really a loophole. It's just that's what the code allows. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, attached ADUs are fine. They're not quite as common as detached ADUs, but in the context of having a regulation that compels you to only have a one-story ADU, if I was in that jurisdiction, I would say, well, I'm going to build it attached because I, it's, it's essential for me to have it be two stories. Off street parking requirements. So in essence, as a rule of thumb, it's fair to say there are no off street parking requirements for ADUs, which is, which is great. There's some nuance to it though. If you happen to be 
more than a half mile from a transit line or stop, then you might have to put in an additional off-street parking spot. But my understanding is that's not really the case in almost any property in Monterey. I can't say that is true for the county per se, but, um, but most urbanized developed areas will be within a half mile of transit. So um, the other notable thing here is, whereas previous to the legislation that went into effect, um, you had to replace your off-street parking spot if you converted your ADU or your garage to an ADU, you now no longer have to do so. So you can, um, you can convert your garage to housing um, and not have to provide additional off-street parking spot, which enables garage conversions, which is, is quite important. Um, that is a, you know, is a simple way to put that. That is saying we as a government are um, validating that housing for people is more important, all things considered, than housing for a vehicle. And I think that is an affirmative, important statement that every government in this country should make. We care more about housing our people than housing our vehicles. And any, any action that a government takes to prioritize housing cars over housing people is an, you know, it's, it's an offense to uh, my, <laughs> my sense of humanity. But, um, but that's another matter because that's not the case in Monterey or any place in California, thank goodness, because of the California legislation. Um, if you are more than a half mile trans from transit, um, you must provide an additional off-street parking spot for each bedroom uh, that you have in your ADU. Um, uh, cities have to allow for tandem parking, which is uh, kind of uh, one car in front of another as a viable off-street parking spot. Um, and you're allowed to have um, parking located within the front yard setback. But we won't focus too much on that because that's going to not be the case for most people who are building an ADU. All right, so if you have an existing non-conforming structure, that is a structure that was built for uh, prior to the existing zoning code that is in effect now, that is to say something you couldn't build today, such as a garage located next to the setback or a structure next to the setback, you can convert that to an ADU legally, which is great. So non-conforming, doesn't conform with the current zoning code, but you can nonetheless convert it to a setback. Um, and uh, a caveat to that is to note that if the structure is built within three feet of the property line, you can't have any windows or doors because the fire might theoretically jump from the interior of that structure through the window door into the adjacent property. So. Uh, so if you have an existing structure that's located within the forfeits at back, um, you might not be able to have windows or doors there, but that's okay. Um, it works fine to have a blank wall. This is an example of an ADU that I visited yesterday that was uh, built within the five-foot setback and no windows or doors here. And there's plenty of needs and applications for walls that don't have windows and doors, like a bathroom, for example, you don't need a door or window going to a bathroom, a, a laundry, uh, a stackable washer dryer might go along that wall. Uh, you might have closets along that wall. So um, it's fine to do that um, if you end up wanting to build or uh, convert a structure within the setback. All right, other significant changes that have occurred uh, statewide that apply in Monterey. Um, all permits are ministerial review. That means that the city can no longer say to you, oh, we don't like what this ADU looks like. You can't, you can't build it. They have to let you build it now if you follow the rules and regulations that we've just covered. Um, they must allow for you to get that permit within 60 days, um, which is a really quick time frame. It used to be 120 days. Um, you, you, you're not compelled to put fire sprinklers in unless you're compelled to do so for the primary house as well. Um, owner occupancy, this is a big pet peeve uh, issue of mine. Um, and I'm thankful to say that California has passed a code statewide that says we will not require owner occupancy at least until 2025. So um, it will be reviewed again at that point. But any ADUs that are developed between now and 2025, I think perpetually cannot have owner occupancy requirements. So that is to say, if you build an ADU, owner occupancy is 
if you build an ADU, thou shalt live on the property indefinitely because you have an ADU, um, which is a, effectively a penalty for you if you build an ADU. And so the state has said, we don't want jurisdictions to put that penalty in effect. So we're gonna have a period of time during which we're gonna allow people to build ADUs and not penalize them um, and see how it goes. And maybe 2025, they'll say, we're not gonna allow owner occupancy anymore statewide. And I hope they do, knock on wood. Um, okay, so the state law says, if you are building an ADU um, under the uh, in, in new entitlements that have uh, been provided statewide, uh, that you cannot use those uh, ADUs for short-term rental. Short-term rental is 30-day or less rental. Think of Airbnb, VRBO. Um, and cities are also entitled, if they wish, to extend that ban to be up to one to six months as well. Um, generally speaking, ADUs are, in you know, the reason that legislators want ADUs to be easy to build is because they want you to provide long-term housing, whether it's for a family member or a rental unit, doesn't matter necessarily to them. They just want you to build long-term housing. And so they're saying, hey, we're gonna make it easy for you. We're gonna supersede and override local jurisdictional barriers to development, but we want you to actually create housing as opposed to a hotel room. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this facet of the code because it doesn't apply to most people and those for whom it does apply will probably be more savvy uh, than, than the average homeowner developer. But um, if you happen to own a multifamily property, in fact, you can build two detached ADUs and you can build one internal ADU for every four units if you have that you have in the building. So in theory, you could have eight units. If you had an eight plex, you could build two internal ADUs and two detached ADUs. I'm not going to focus on that, like I said, because that's pretty rarely applicable to people. For those for whom it is applicable, I would say just go to talk to your local planning official and try to understand the code, read the legislation yourself, get to know it, and know what your rights are. Um, so um, I guess I'm going to pause there and see whether Kelly wants to ask some questions that might have come up that relate to some of the regulations. Yeah. And and I'll also say if if Andy Flower happens to be on this call or another planning official happens to be on this call and they want to chime in, I welcome that because I, I don't want to pretend to be the authority and I'll be all of these questions, but I'll do my best to try to answer questions that did come up. So um, one question that we had is related to, I guess, the, the, how the county or state ordinances work with local ordinances. So there was a question about how do new ordinances, ordinances that are passed in a city um, coincide or, or dovetail with uh, county ordinances? I mean, basically the state supersedes all local, all county codes. Um, and so I think that's a good thing in part because it's so hard to pass good codes at the local level because of the politics of doing so. Um, so this statewide sweeping set of regulations, although confusing, does in fact do just that. It supersedes all local jurisdictional codes. Local jurisdictions can create more liberal codes than the state codes if they wish, but they can't create more restrictive codes than what I just covered. So if, for example, the city of Monterey was like, we really want ADUs, we're going to allow for two-story ADUs, they could do that. But right now, they are not compelled to do that by state law. Um, thank you. Another question that we had is related to, we had a couple questions related to homeowners associations. Um, my understanding is that homeowners associations um, are not under California state law allowed to prohibit ADUs, but we had a couple of people ask if homeowners associations don't allow an ADU, does that mean that they can't build one? Or um, how do the new California state regulations relate to single family homes in um, homeowners associations? Yeah, and this is a really important topic. Again, there's gonna be inevitably gonna be legal challenges and these things will get clarified over the course of the next couple of years. But yeah, you are right, Kelly, that um, anybody in an HOA cannot, there, the there cannot be regulations anymore that preclude you under California law 
from building an ADU even within an HOA where they explicitly condemn you from doing so. Now, how that's going to work out in practice is a different question, but in theory, as a as a you know as a legal matter, the law is on your side to be able to build an ADU in an HOA that explicitly says you can't. Um, so we'll see how all that plays out. I don't think there's been, any, uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any actual legal challenges yet in the state of California. So um, maybe one of the people on the call today will be one of the first people to uh, create one of those legal challenges. And I look forward to reading about it in the newspaper. But, uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the bottom line. Okay, thanks. Um, and I had a couple questions related to some terms that were used. Um, one was, can you just explain the difference between a regular edition and a JADU? Yeah, so the junior ADU code, you can do up to a 500 square foot conversion of your primary building envelope. So that can include an attached garage or not. Um, but, uh, and I think the code, there's some confusion about this, but I think the code will allow you to build up to a 150 square foot addition. So if you had an attached garage and you could build on, it was 350 square feet, you could build on another 150 square feet to create additional space that would become a junior ADU. If you wanted to do an addition to your house that, let's say you have a house that doesn't have an attached garage, let's just say, you could build a bump out addition that is up to 800 square feet or up to a thousand square feet if it's a two bedroom. And that would be a permissible, viable, buy right way you could build an ADU. That wouldn't be classified as an ADU, oh, sorry, as a junior ADU, it would be classified as an ADU. Um, so there's addition to ADUs, there's junior ADUs, which are in, always going to be internal carve out ADUs, although there's a little bit of exception there. Um, and I should mention that junior ADU code doesn't, uh, one of the things that I don't like about it is that it ca cities can require owner occupancy in those cases. So that's something to be cognizant of, of, of and they also can require off street parking. So that, that's something that I don't want to, I don't want to speak to how that's going to be interpreted locally, but just be aware that if you build a junior ADU, you might be subject to those two things that I classify as the number two, the number one and the number two poison pills for ADUs. I wouldn't want to build an ADU if it compelled me to live on site and to build an additional off street parking spot. So I would, do whatever I had to do to not call it a junior ADU to avoid those poison pills if the jurisdiction put have those poison pills in effect, which it might. Um, and then another question related to something you mentioned, a bump out, is that different than an attached ADU or are those the same thing? It's a, yeah, this is vernacular description of a, an attached, so the reason I, I, I call it a bump out is to say, when people say attached ADUs, that can be Attached could be a basement conversion, internal conversion, junior ADU. But when you say a bump out, it tell it it helps it, it convey that you're talking about an addition, a new structural addition to the primary dwelling. And so that's that's what I mean by bump out addition. And then um, I did add uh, Andy Flower on as a panelist. Oh, great. I don't know if he wants to answer some of the questions. Or, or has something to answer related to what you were saying before, but I'm gonna unmute him. Yeah, great. And Andy, you know, any, I would invite you to correct anything I said that was incorrect, um, because I'm gonna defer to your knowledge about the local code as it stands right now in the city of Monterey. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but I, I, I figured- Oh no, it. it's great. Thank you for your presentation. Really well done. I really enjoyed, some of the graphics um, and, and some of the ways that you prevent, present the information, particularly about the idea that um, up to an 800 square foot home or ADU, that that's where you can have the, um, the waiver and, and to understand that beyond that size, once you get to 801 square feet, that that's when you then have to be mindful of the uh, setbacks and all of those regulations. I think that's that's a really clever way to say it. I've been struggling with how to present that information. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, did I make any other misstatements that you would like to correct based on the existing code? Not what's being proposed, but that which exists currently? Well, you know, there, there's a number of gray area places and um, 
and one of them may well be uh, the height and until a, a city can um, pass their own regulations it appears that for single-family homes uh, that there is not in fact height restriction in place it's it's a little tricky to read it I, I I've read it so many times and so have our city attorneys and and applicants and and but we just heard word today from HCD um, speaking of which I would love to get that document if you'd be willing to share it I, I have heard word of it the word has traveled faster than the document itself so if you could share it that'd be great yeah for sure I'll um, yeah I'll share it with you we may be in a, a window of a, of a period of time right now where um, height restrictions uh, for a single family uh, property with um, a proposed ADU, um, it, it may be similar to, again, I, I really appreciate the way that you presented the idea of an addition that you could build up to that full height, that 25 foot height that we have in place in single family zone. And, and that it appears, um, and this is just brand new today that we're realizing this, um, and uh, it, it appears that it, it may be true that that, uh, that 25 foot height may be the limit until we have an ordinance in place. Yeah, for an attached ADU, I'm certain it is. Um, I mean, I, I would, yeah, I would know if, I would be fairly surprised if there wasn't a mechanism to do that. Um, I guess but, the but new the, information is detached. The details are, the one question that's in the detail there that I think is important to, um, for homeowners to consider is when it's an attached ADU, bump out ADU, does it have to have two conditioned walls that are sharing, that are, sh you know, two conditioned spaces, or can you have a breezeway connection that is non-conditioned space connecting an attached structure? That, that would be the question I would pose to get the creative juices flowing for homeowners, but also if you could offer any clarification on that, that would be helpful. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and just to clarify, uh, our, our new information today is that the detached would would also be allowed to be up to 25 feet. Oh. It, and, until a city has its own regulations. As, as we read the state code, it enables a city to allow for that restriction, but until a regulation is in place, it's the underlying zoning that rules, it appears. Where we still need to make certain of that, but it, it, it was um, potentially from the HCD that we're discovering this. So wow. uh, it's just evolving every day, right? Yeah. But, but your question about attached and, and what does that mean? And if you have a deck, for instance, or a breezeway in between that's not conditioned space, this is a question that we've wrestled with with other sites as well. And uh, um, I, I really need to make sure that I'm speaking for the whole of the department and making sure that I'm, I'm uh, not going against any precedent that we've set, just even in this last year for a similar question. Got it. it well, it's a good one, though. It's a good way to think of creatively outside the box. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and, and, and my role is to kind of help homeowners think creatively outside the box to make your job tough. So, um, but thank you for jumping in and, and, and helping out and letting me put you on the spot a little bit. So... Um, if people do have questions about some of these nuanced zoning questions, I would encourage you to reach out to Andy um, uh, afterwards. Um, and as, as you can see, uh, it's not just me that's a little bit confused about these things. Even the people who are in charge of these codes at the local level won't necessarily know the answers right offhand. So um, is there any more questions, Kelly, that might be good for Andy and I to address before I move on from? I think, I think there's two, two main um, questions that I think should be addressed. And one is how do you, how, and one is just a general question, but um, how do you get started and who do you go to? Um, some people are feeling a little bit lost as to whether they should go to an architect first, the planning department, or who they should go to first to get their project started. And then the other question is really the other question. There's a series of questions related to water credits. This applies specifically to the city of Monterey. So I think um, this would be a good question for Andy to answer. But there's several um, several questions on water credits and um, gray water. Um, so how can you add a bathroom washer dryer? Um, what is a gray wa what are ideas for gray water options um, and yeah I think that's it 
Well, gray water is this new exciting concept that we, well, it's, it's exciting and new in that it's now encouraged for single family as well as multifamily. And so uh, typically what it, what it allows for is uh, capture of sink water and reuse with uh, toilets and potentially maybe also washing machines. And if, if somebody's interested in that and they want to understand the, um, the technicalities around that, they can contact the water district. They have someone there right now who is uh, really focused on this and, and able to answer any technical question. And just to give a, an idea of, of the price for that, we've heard from one applicant who, um, who got an estimate at about $6,500 for a, a single family home that, that then has enabled them to create, as, well, as long as the design can go forward, um, a, a detached ADU as well as uh, a junior ADU and a master suite upstairs with a with a full bathroom. So it it um, I think they're also doing some conservation efforts. So that's another way that folks can um, can create water credits where they may not have enough to begin with. Great, thanks, thanks, Andy. All right, I'll 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 let you off the hook now, and I'll continue on. And I'll and Kelly, I'll take that question. Um, right now regarding, you know, steps. Uh, so I'll just continue on. Um, so the, the very first kind of step um, from a regulatory point of view, and we'll get back to the pragmatic, you know, development step-by-step -step process, but from a regulatory point of view to, to close that loop, there's kind of, I, I want homeowners to think about kind of three facets to the development regulations um, or three bureaucratic thresholds that you have to circumnavigate which are or not that you have to navigate so there's the planning and zoning regulations which is the exterior look and feel of the structure how big it is how tall it is the zone all that kind of stuff what it looks like from the street the setbacks all that stuff then there's the building and life safety requirements which are about the interior uh, building requirements. How high are the ceilings? Um, are there smoke detectors in the, in the bedrooms? Is there ventilation above the stove? Is there egress windows? A windows you can get out from, from a bedroom in the case of a fire. Those are building and life safety issues. Two different kind of departments. Um, the planning officials might not know the building and life safety rules. The building and life safety people might not know the planning and zoning rules necessarily. Um, and then once you get your permit, then you're going into the actual construction process and the building inspectors are the people who actually come out to your site and check in on the work during construction and ensure that your contractors, yourself, your subcontractors, your electricians and plumbers are doing their work to code. They might not care so much what's on the plans, rather their interest is in ensuring that the construction techniques that are being used on site are being done to the current state structural building electrical life safety standards um, as you know so so those are kind of the three different regulators that you have to be mindful of there's other ones too but those are kind of the three big ones that you have to think about as you're going through this stuff um, so um, I'll, I'll I'll go into the se sequencing of the way I think about um, building an ADU in terms of step-by-step step step process, which is, if for those of you who got this book, if you go to chapter two, that is where I have the step-by-step -step process uh, laid out for people. So page 21, um, the very first step is, is really financing and costs, and, and it's a circular question because you don't know how much this thing is going to cost because you don't know what you're going to build. But what I'm going to do in the next slides is show you roughly how to think about some of these costs. That will help you reverse engineer how much money you might think you need. Then you have to figure out how much, how you're going to get that money uh, in order to pay for this thing because this thing is going to be very expensive. Um, and that will help you understand what type of ADU you might be able to build. Then you can start to put uh, pen to paper on a napkin, draw something out. 
with your partner, yourself, your friends, figure some idea of what it is that you want. I would then personally, if it was me, go talk to the city and say, hey, just want to make sure I can do this. Now, when I say go talk to the city. I understand we're in COVID now. You can't just go down to the city and talk to them as easily as you normally can. But um, let's say you hypothetically could see other people in person, which would be just wild and crazy. Um, that's what I would recommend that you would do. Um, but you could also go at this point to a, an architect um, and, and, and kind of try to understand what your entitlements are. Um, but but if, I, if it was me doing this, I would do a little bit of that legwork up front to just say, okay, I, I just wanna make sure I understand this code. I've read the HCD guidance. I've seen the city's website about ADUs, but I understand the HCD guidance is really the, the actual guidance that cities have to follow. Um, and so I think I could do this, but I just wanna check in with Andy Flower and show him my drawing. And, and if Andy says it's good, then I'm gonna proceed with the notion that I can do this. Then you have to talk to a builder. And I mean, this is what I'd recommend anyway. Before this is, and this is not the conventional way to do it. Usually when, when homeowners are going through projects, conventionally what happens is, hey, they say, hey, architect, draw up a set of plans. Hey, got the set of plans. Let me shop it around to a bunch of bidder, uh, builders for bids. And and then the builder's like, yeah, I could do this. And I'll give you know the cheapest price. And here's the cheapest price. And and you're like, all right, cool, submit it to the city. And I'd say that's not the right way to go about it in the case of an ADU. ADUs are really expensive, they're complicated, there's a lot of rules and regulations. So I think the best way to start is really thinking about the cost of what it's gonna be up front. Um, I'll give you some rules of thumb about that in a minute. Then kind of work your way back into finding a builder, um, which is a little bit counterintuitive because the, the builder is the one who's gonna actually help you know how much this thing is really gonna cost down to a, a more granular level. And then once you've, had, once you've identified a builder, th then you can start to hone in on what the actual scope of work would be. Maybe you're like, okay, I can do a detached ADU. I know I, I, know I can afford a detached ADU, but I don't, I don't know if I could do a, a, a 600 square foot detached ADU or a 1000 square foot detached ADU. The builder is the one who's gonna know, hey, wood is really expensive these days because of coronavirus so we can't, your wood package is going to be super expensive and therefore you're not going to be able to build a 1000 square foot ADU like you had thought. You can really only do a 600 square foot ADU. That, at that point, that's when you can start to get into the nitty gritty development or design development with, with an architect. Um, now an architect, it, 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 there's different ways to go about this process. I don't want to say that that's the only way to go about it, but that's what I would do. That's what I recommend people do. I um, mean, it's not the intuitive way to go about it. Um, but I think it's the right way to go about it. Um, on the other hand, if you do have a good handle on construction costs, or if you're not concerned about the ultimate budget of this thing, because you know you have sufficient cash to do it, then you can be like, okay, I'm gonna, I, I'd still say it's worthwhile identifying a builder prior to getting involved with the design work, because that relationship you're gonna have with the builder is ultimately gonna be more intimate and uh, more, important in many ways than the architect, than the relationship with the architect, because that builder relationship is the one that they're going to be the ones working with you for six months, constructing this thing, interacting with you on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the entire project. And oftentimes people don't consider that relationship until they've gotten the permits, you know, submitted to the city. The builder looks at it and it's like, I can build this, but that's going to be so expensive. Like, why would you do that? And that's why I'm like, I'm pretty pretty bullish on this design build approach, which is where you incorporate the builder into the design and the designer into the build. I think that's the best approach. It doesn't have to be a design build company, but rather a design build process. Um, but there's other ways to skim this cat. There are other solutions such as prefab ADUs, which are a more common thing in California. And they, you know, in those contexts, they take care of the design and build essentially up front. They more or less know the cost of the structure up front. Um, if you go down the prefab route, just know that you, you want to be mindful of the costs that are not listed on the website, such as what's it going to cost to do the site plan, the permit fees, the utility connections, the foundation costs, the landscaping. All those things can add up to be a lot of money. So don't be fooled if you see a website that says we can, you know, these 80, this structure is a hundred thousand bucks. Well, what about all the other costs associated with the development process? So when you, when you reach out to prefab companies, if you choose to do that, just know that there's a lot of other costs that might not be apparent up front. Um, 
So that's kind of my thinking about the design build like first step. Um, but hopefully in the next slides, they'll get a sense of, uh, you know, the cost and that might help um, you understand a little bit more about where to start. So um, before we move on from regulations too far though, I wanted to mention that California does have a Title 24 standard, which is an energy code requirement that, meant, that says thou shalt put on solar panels if you're doing a non-manufactured detached ADU. Um, Title 24 is a complicated standard. There's Title 24 consultants that uh, work in this field. Um, Title 24, as a just general matter, I understand it to be a little bit of a, um, it's actually, uh, while I, I really am bullish on green building, et cetera, I think Title 24 is actually a little bit problematic uh, for ADUs because ADUs are small. It's hard to meet the Title 24 standards related to glazing, which is windows and doors and insulation requirements. It's a little bit overkill for what is really necessary when you're building a small dwelling, it's gonna use so little energy that it's perhaps almost a barrier to have these onerous energy code standards that are trying to do the right thing, but they're making construction more expensive than it really should be. Um, for example, a water, uh, what is it? There's a, a heat pump water heater is like one of the few compliant ways to have a water heater, but it's really big and really expensive to have this heat pump water system. And it's a little bit overkill I have a 13 or 39 gallon tank um, electric conventional water heater and our bills are like literally 20 bucks a month in this unit. I'm not kidding. So, um, so yeah, and that translates directly to the actual energy impact of this unit on, on the planet. So I would, you know, as an advocacy matter, I'd say Title 24 needs some tweaking, but as a practical matter, you have to comply with 20, Title 24. Um, so anyway, you don't need to know about all that stuff, but an architect or engineer would definitely help you get through that Title 24 process. Okay, so let's talk about the homeowner economics of ADUs. Um, how much do these things cost? What are the payback periods for them? What are the commonly used tools for financing an ADU? Um, so this is some data points that I wanna put out there. I wanna make a couple caveats up front. A, it's from Portland. So prices are more expensive in California. B, it's from a series of projects that happened over the last like five, six years. So even in Portland, it's a little bit dated because numbers are keep on escalating, unfortunately, in every market. Cost materials are going up, subcontract costs are going up, GC costs are going up, everybody's prices are going up. Um, and that's just the reality. But with all that said, I want to make some points and observations that I can draw from this graphic. Number one, these are all detached new construction ADUs, so they're all apples to apples. Uh, we are not talking about attached ADUs, we're not talking about garage conversion ADUs, we're talking about detached new construction. So in theory, you have a clean slate to work with and the cost should theoretically make rational sense as to some of the re reasons why things might cost more or less. So number one, I want to point out, yeah, smaller ADUs are going to cost less, obviously. There's less materials, less labor involved, but they're not that much less than large ADUs. It's only marginally more expensive to build a larger ADU. Whether it's 800 square feet or 1,000 square feet, it doesn't really matter. It's a marginal increase. And that is to say, that's because there's a fixed cost to development. You cannot do an ADU for like less than 100,000 bucks pretty much in any West Coast market because of the cost of a foundation, because of the cost of doing electrical upgrades to your property, because of the cost of of um, getting an architect because of the each and every trade that you have come out to your site is going to have a fixed price. A painter who's coming out to your site still has to transport themselves to your site, still has to do setup, still has to go to the paint stop, paint store, buy paint, still has to break down, transport home. So they're not going to charge you 30 cents just because you're doing a one square foot swath of paint on your wall. They would only charge you marginally more for a hundred square foot swath on your wall. And so that same principle can be applied throughout the whole construction process. So each and every trade is going to have a fixed cost. Um, you won't, at least in the Portland market, you won't find a plumber to do any ADU for less than like 10 grand. Um, even if it's a simple garage conversion ADU in theory, it's still going to be expensive for the plumber. Um, and so there's kind of a fixed cost to development, regardless of what type of uh, size ADU you're doing. And so as a rational homeowner, you might consider the fact that 
if you can afford to do a bigger ADU, if you're looking at this from an income generation perspective, then building a bigger ADU does make more sense because it's only marginally more expensive to build a slight, you know, a bigger ADU. Um, not to say you should necessarily, I'm a big small housing advocate, obviously, but you know, if I'm being honest, like rationally, it's, you know, a two bedroom ADU is going to pencil out for you as a homeowner better than a, a studio style ADU because the rental income that you can get is significantly more. So that's one reason why the cluster of data points that we see of permitted ADUs in the Portland market are all clustering near the upper threshold of what's permissible. So that's one factor. Um, another factor, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's the main point I wanted to make there. So in the Portland market, and probably it's not that dissimilar down in Monterey, though probably a tiny bit more, I'm guessing, uh, is that it's in the Portland market, it's gonna be um, for 800 square foot ADU, it's gonna count cost um, 160 to $280,000 with a median of $200,000. You're gonna see different numbers out there from everybody, but I'm trying, when I give these numbers, what I'm trying to do is incorporate what you as the homeowner are going to experience, not what the builder is going to charge, not what the architect is going to charge, not what the city is going to charge, but all those things, plus some other stuff. That is to say, I include sweat equity. Uh, so I, when I get these data points, I'm asking for homeowners to add in the value of their sweat equity. A lot of homeowners put in a lot of sweat equity and that's worth something. I put in $25,000 of sweat equity into my last two ADUs. And so I incorporate that figure into my ultimate total cost when I'm giving these figures. Um, but uh, so I add that in, I add the design costs, the utility connection costs, the permit costs and the construction costs. And all those things collectively are what get me these figures. So if you go to that prefab site and it says $100,000, you gotta be like, oh yeah, how much is that foundation gonna cost that I'm gonna have to put in? How much is the utility connection gonna be? Um, so, uh, one of the things I'll also warn you about is the cost per square foot metric is not really a useful metric to use in the ADU context because the numbers won't, they'll be so high for ADUs on a per square foot basis. So rather, I like to think about the, just the total construction cost and that, that's the number I use. So the uh, total construction cost might be $200,000 for an 800 square foot ADU. It might be, say, uh, $160,000 for a 400 square foot ADU. These days in Portland, it's gone up a little bit from that. I'd say it's closer to 180 to 200,000, maybe 210 to 250 for the average statistical average 800 square foot ADU. A lot of ADUs are coming in at closer to $300,000 now. So these are some rough numbers for you to consider. If you're going to do an attached bump out ADU, it's going to be similar to these costs. If you're gonna do an internal conversion or a garage conversion, it's gonna be a very different cost and that's what we're gonna talk about next. That is because an internal conversion ADU, already, you've already built the structural shell. You do not have to bring out the foundation folks. You don't have to bring out the siders, the framers, the roofers, all that stuff is done. And so as a result, you, if your structural shell is in good condition, doesn't need to be upgraded, you don't need a new roof, your costs are gonna go dramatically down as a rule of thumb, what I say is the cost of construction will be roughly half that of new construction if it's a conversion of a pre-existing permitted structural shell that's in viable condition. A lot of caveats, there's a lot of structural shells that are not in good shape, but if it is in good shape and it can be converted, that is a very cost efficient way to produce an ADU. The ADU I'm sitting in now, 800 square feet, cost $100,000 to build. If it was new construction, detached, it would have cost $200,000 to build. So this is a good example of that. Um, and I'll also mention, if you have a finished habitable living space that you're converting to an ADU, that's gonna be cheaper still, right? So um, if, if it's just a matter of kind of restructuring the walls to create separation between two spaces, that's going to be the least, least expensive ADU. That's fairly uncommon, and at least in the Portland market. Um, but if there's a lot of large homes, um, perhaps that will be a more common thing in certain markets in California. Don't know. Well, there isn't really the data to support those kinds of assertions yet, but, but th this is the important, you know, distinction to think about. Detached construction slash attached bump out ADUs versus conversions of existing spaces as far as the cost threshold to, 
to you know the, this is that's where you're going to get that big price differentiation. And then I'll also mention because we're talking here about the California market, prefab is a more significant uh, way to develop ADUs in California because cost, construction costs are going to be more expensive in California, um, and there's labor shortages uh, in a lot of the more desirable areas like you know where you guys are um, there's going to be more affordable adu development options by buying prefabricated units that are built elsewhere um, it's hard to make assertions about how that's going to all play out in terms of the numbers of adus being built in california but um, but it's definitely a bigger factor in California than it is in Oregon, where labor isn't quite as expensive as it is in California. So I could, it's fair to say that, you know, you and many other people are probably thinking about prefab. I'll just put out some thoughts about prefab here for your consideration. ADUs oftentimes are, you know, people love their property. They're going to live there forever. Oftentimes custom is really what people want because you can't do you can't get the or the structure to look exactly like or be configured. You can't get the floor plan to be exactly what you want it to be if it's a prefab unit. That said, one-story units, which is the what the code generally speaking will allow in California by right, unless this 25-foot rule is actually in effect. Um, there's only so many floor plans you can do with 400 square feet and a one-story structure. So in that in that regard, maybe prefab does have uh, more of a there's less design opportunities in some ways. So therefore prefab might be more logical. Um, it's also a quicker form of development in terms of construction. So there's definitely some advantages to prefab, um, especially in areas where labor is really sh hard to come by. Okay, so ADUs are very expensive as we've established. So let's think about why in the world you'd wanna build one. If you are building it, um, the way to think about the payback period, if you're building it for rental income is, um, or if that's one of your motivations, is simply how long will it take to pay for the cost of construction by the additional rental income that you can generate from having the ADU on your property? So let's take three scenarios. Joe builds an 800 square foot ADU, costs $180,000, rents it out for 1,200 bucks a month. That's $14,400 per year. That's a 12.5 year, 12 year payback for Joe before the ADU has paid for itself. Scenario B, Joe builds an ADU and says, aha, I'm gonna get smart about this. I'm gonna move into the ADU, rent out the primary house. I'm gonna make more money by renting out the primary house as a result. And, and then his um, timeline or his payback period is, has, has dropped from, uh, uh, from 12.5 years to 10 years. And now in scenario C, Joe says, okay, I'm gonna get really smart about this. I'm gonna build an 80, 800 square foot ADU. I'm gonna rent out both the primary house and the ADU. And now the timeline is, it's only gonna take 5.5 years for Joe to pay for the cost of construction. Except the only problem is now Joe is homeless and that's a bummer for Joe. So um, the other thing, the other factor I wanna mention here is that all these payback periods are pretty decent and these aren't even looking at the contributory value of the ADU. So Joe builds this 800 square foot AU instead of uh, thinking about how long it's gonna take for it to pay for itself, Joe's like, well, if I had to move, if I had to leave the property, move away to a different town for whatever reason, how long would I need to wait for the ADU, ADU to, be a, to have been a rational investment? And while we don't have a good sense of the contributory value of ADUs yet, um, let's just say, finger in the wind guess, no clue if this is true, but let's say an ADU adds half of what it costs to construct. So instead of, you know, you pay, pay $180,000 and add $90,000 of value to the property. So when Joe does that, all of a sudden the payback period gets cut in half from 12.5 years to 6.8 years, because Joe can now say in 6.8 years, I could sell this property and not be at a financial loss for having built the ADU. So if you're gonna stay on the property for 6.8 years, you're good to go, Joe. Now, if Joe was to say, I'm gonna build this ADU in order to make a windfall and sell this property as soon as I'm done, Joe would go out of business, um, at least as far as I'm concerned. Now there's some debate going on about the contributory value of ADUs in the California market, but that's my assertion is that ADUs don't add as much value as they cost to construct. And I'm sticking to it until I see evidence, uh, significant evidence otherwise. Um, so, 
But not everybody is building an ADU for purely rational financial motivations. In this case, Granny wants to live near her grandkids, so she funds the construction of a 500 square foot ADU. She pays 60,000 bucks for the construction of an ADU on her son's property. The son designs and builds the ADU for her. Let's call it a junior ADU in this case. So for 60K, Granny gets a place to live rent and mortgage free as uh, close to her kids and grandkids for as long as she wants. This is like the scenario that Chris uh, Lopez was giving us at the beginning. Um, and the young parents invest sweat equity and in turn gain significant equity in their property. Um, so, but there's all these other built-in financial benefits to this arrangement that people, you know, may or may not actually put numbers to, but, you know, it's at least worth considering what, what is the value of the, all these things, you know, like built-in babysitting forever. That's pretty significant. Built-in car sharing, built-in meal sharing, built-in sharing chores, built-in property care, caretaking, pet caretaking, less commuting for family social events, and the biggest benefit of all, not having to share a roof with your mother or mother-in-law. All right, so property tax impacts of ADUs uh, in Monterey County. We think that this is a good rule of thumb to consider, although we're not positive, that there is a 1% um, approximate baseline um, to consider. So for every $100,000 of value that you're adding, your taxes will go up by 1,000 bucks. No assessor in their right mind would say something so simple to you, but I'm gonna say something so simple to you because I'm not an assessor, but I would encourage you to call your assessor and say, hey, I'm gonna be adding a $200,000 ADU. Let's assume that you guys think I've added $150,000 of contributory value because you've underguessed what you know the actual construction cost was. How much would that add to my property tax base um, per year, you know, for that year? And they'll say, okay, yeah, $150,000 is gonna add $1,500 uh, in tax burden. That, that's how you wanna think about um, going about determining what the real estate property tax impacts will be of building an ADU. And as a general rule of thumb, you can just say, you know, the less expensive your ADU, the less taxes is gonna add. So it's pretty straightforward. A junior ADU that costs $50,000 might only add $500 of additional tax burden per year. Um, Appraisals of ADUs are complicated, um, so I don't want to go into this in too much depth right now, but I'll just say that um, this is an issue that that merits, you know, much more policy and research work, um, but, but right now what you're not going to be able to find are a lot of comps of properties in Monterey with ADUs because there's only been 12 that have been permitted in the city of Monterey, and guess what? They're not selling because why would they? Because it would be irrational to do so, so you're not going to find sales comps that appraisers can use as sales comps for ADUs. So this is going to be a chicken and egg problem that's going to occur in every jurisdiction where ADUs are starting to take off forevermore. Um, and uh, I just want to flag that for you to know that this is not a solved matter. It's solved in markets where there are a lot of ADUs being built, like Portland, but there, there's just not a lot of those markets in the country yet. But there will be before too long, once Monterey starts to kick off its AD movement. Um, so I'm gonna keep going only because we're running a little bit tight on time and, um, and then we'll do some questions and answers at the end. So Portland ADUs are booming, but financing stinks. Uh, this is from a 2011 article written in Portland. And this was true back in 2011, but financing is getting better and better. And so we're gonna talk about some of the financing options that are out there. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the most tried and true common ways to fund an ADU. As we've said many, many times, ADUs are very expensive. So how are you going to pay for this thing? They're so expensive. Um, this is the big barrier to development apart from regulations, which are now addressed, solved in California statewide. So how are you going to afford $200,000? Well, it's going to be a combination of these different mechanisms. It's always going to be a com 95% of the time, it's a patchwork of these different funding mechanisms. So it's a combination of uh, savings, stock liquidations, and 401k loans. I like to give a shout out to 401k loans because if you have a 401k, you can borrow, I think, up to $50,000 of it. And then when you borrow that money, you pay that loan interest rate back to yourself. So there is no more efficient uh, loan vehicle than that because you're not paying that loan interest back to a bank, you're paying it to yourself. Even, even in today's very low interest rate world, it's still a, you know kind of the lowest interest rate loan that you can get. Um, then if you have 
owned a property for a couple of years, you are lucky because your property has increased in value. Um, if you're on the West Coast, this is true pretty much throughout the whole West Coast. Um, and, and this is going to be really the lion's share of the way that most people will pay for the majority of their ADU. Not all of it, but oftentimes most of it. And it's, there's kind of two mechanisms you can consider. There's a home equity line of credit and there's a cash out refinance. A home equity line of credit is where the bank says, okay, you bought a home, $500,000, now it's worth $800,000, let's say. So you have $300,000 of equity you can pull from, we'll loan you up to say $250,000 if your debt to income ratio will allow for you to do so. And then you can use that $250,000 for whatever you want. If you leave it in your bank account and don't touch it, you don't have to pay any interest. And that's a pretty flexible mechanism to consider. Um, pretty efficient um, uh, in that if you don't use it, you don't have to pay anything. A cash out refinance is the flip side of that to, and that's to say, okay, let's say you're like, oh, the interest rate these days are killer, 2.75 on a refi because my interest rate is 5% right now. If I'm gonna refi, I might as well pull cash out of the property because the property's gone up from 500 to 800. So I'm gonna pull out, let's say I'll, I'll say that I want a $700,000 mortgage, get $200,000 uh, in cash and they'll take over the first mortgage. And, and then you have $200,000 to work with at this really low interest rate that's fixed for 30 years. The only problem with this approach or thing, thing to be mindful is, is that you're immediately having to pay for the principal and interest on that $700,000 loan. Um, and so if you wanted to refinance anyway, this is probably the better approach to consider. But if you weren't gonna refinance your primary mortgage, then maybe a HELOC would be better. But I don't wanna speak out of turn. I would say once, now that you understand those two options, talk to a mortgage lender, see which one would be better for you. They'll help you figure out which of those two mechanisms is the better approach to consider, given a lot of variables that I won't go into. Um, another, another funding mechanism isn't really funding, but that is to say, if you wanna reduce your out-of-pocket expenses because it's too expensive for you, do a, put in some sweat equity. That's what I've done. And um, you know, to the extent that you can build an ADU yourself, which isn't the case for 95% of people, but if you can build some of the ADU yourself, you'll obviously save some of the construction costs. Um, in general, homeowners can do a lot of the work themselves, legally speaking, um, um, though I don't wanna overstep my knowledge of the rules and regulations for general contractors in California. But as a general matter, you can at least do some portions of the work, painting, uh, trim, cabinetry, flooring, um, tiling maybe. Um, and so there's certainly a lot of finished work that you can do that will reduce your out-of-pocket expenses. Um, <clears throat> so that's an option. Then there's funding, uh, there's family loans and other non-secured lines of credit. Family loans is, hey, mom is um, got all of her money in a conservative money market portfolio earning 2% a year. I'm gonna borrow money from mom pay her 5% a year and she'll make more money from me as her son than she would if she just left her money in a conservative money market portfolio. You can help her out by borrowing her money in that way. So consider that option. You can do it as formally or as informally as you want, depending on your relationship with your family, friends, whatever. Um, and, and then lastly, non-secured lines of credit. Um, non-secured lines of credit are things like credit cards. This is not an advisable approach, but something I'll at least put out there for your consideration. If you have no other options, you know, Home Depot has a line of credit that's good for up to like 50,000 bucks for a project loan credit card. And that is to say you can build buy goods and services from Home Depot that's good for um, up to 50,000 bucks. And, and then after six months is when the credit card interest rates kick in. So um, you ideally wanna pay that off before that six month period, um, but that's a definitely a good way to get a good chunk of money. There's also personal loans that local banks and credit unions will offer. Um, and these are personal loans that are not secured against your real estate assets, but rather just against your own in monetary portfolio, I guess, for lack of a better term. So if you have cash in the bank or stocks, they'll loan you money and, and match how much you have in the bank as far as what they're what they're willing to lend to you. Those interest rates aren't going to be especially good, but but they are, you know, it's a it's an option. If you need a bunch of cash and you don't have any other options, it's an option. Um, but I want to spend a minute talking about um, conventional renovation financing um, here. 
These are not quite as common yet as these other patchworked mechanisms that I've talked about, but, but these are definitely on the rise. Um, there are um, <clears throat> uh, ways to look at the after rehab value of a, of a project and actually get a loan for that amount. Um, so that is to say, if you have a property that's worth $500,000 and you're gonna build an ADU, um, the bank would say, oh, you know, your property is going to be worth $700,000 when you're done. So we're going to loan you $700,000. We will pay off your first mortgage and we will hold that additional $200,000 in escrow and we will give it to the builder as the builder finishes each phase of construction. So um, these different mechanisms are all different mechanisms to consider for uh, doing uh, renovation loan financing. Um, okay. So electrical connections, I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna kind of go uh, quick through this so we have time for Q&A. But um, you are not required to have separate meters, I don't believe, for an ADU, although it might be something you would wanna consider doing anyway, even if you're not compelled to do so. Um, a separate meter, gives you independent meter reads for each unit and therefore makes the administration of the utility bills easier in the long run. So you can give the ADU occupant their own bill and they can cover their own bill. And if they don't pay their bill, their power gets shut off. Um, a single meter head doesn't give you that flexibility, but it would be cheaper upfront to do so. So if you're doing like a multi-generational compound style ADU development for your families, you might just want a single meter for that. Um, the meter is one thing, but the panel is another. Um, the, the, the feature that you must abide by, or the rule of thumb that you should abide by with ADUs or think about with ADUs is the occupant of unit A should never have to go inside of unit B in order to turn off or on their utilities. So in the case of, of an electrical panel, what that means is each unit would have to have its own electrical panel or the, the electrical panel would have to be housed in a common space, that is a space like a garage that isn't part of unit A or part of unit B, or the, AD, the panel could be on the exterior of the house. Those are all different mechanisms that the occupant of unit A and unit B can access their own panel without going through the other person's unit. So the idea here is if unit A occupant was on vacation for six months, you could still operate your own power without going through unit A. Gas isn't uh, as common uh, in California, but, uh, but you would have to have, you can have separate gas meters, uh, separate addresses. You'll get assigned a separate address uh, by the city that you'll have to post uh, to be visible from the street. And this is for emergency response. Um, the mailbox is actually something that you have discretion over, at least in this market, you don't have to put in a secondary mailbox. You can have a single mailbox, interestingly. Um, uh, utility connections uh, for sewer here. This is a, an example of a trench in which a sewer is being connected from an ADU to the primary house. And so you don't have to do a new dedicated sewer tap out to the street, out to the right of way, thank goodness, because that would cost you an arm and a leg, like 20,000 um, bucks. You don't have to do it. You simply tap into the sewer on your existing property. Sometimes that a detached ADU, they'll dig a trench, bore a hole through the foundation wall of the primary house, attach, the sewer to that existing sewer stack within your basement or within the lower level of your primary house. And then that sewer simply extends out to the street as it always has. Sometimes the sewer connection will happen outside of the primary house building envelope in the, in the, somewhere in the property before you get to the right of way. So that's how sewer works. Water, um, you are not required to have a separate dedicated water connection, which is also a really expensive thing. Rather it's teed off at some point uh, on your private property, either within the basement or lower level of your primary house or somewhere out in the yard. And uh, a connection will come off, run out to the ADU uh, based on that single um, connection point, uh, run out to your ADU and then there'll be a shut off somewhere in your ADU for your own water um, fixtures uh, so that you can turn off your water in the case of a leak without affecting the water of the other housing unit, the primary dwelling unit. Okay, so um, we've gone over a lot of information today. I just wanted to say that um, in my book, which a lot of you 
purchased online, um, we go through these different chapters. So uh, these are these are all for homeowners, and this goes through a lot of what we talked about today, but in more detail, especially in the design principles chapter, which we didn't really talk about. So I would encourage you to pick up this book. You know, it's it's got a lot of good information in there that you can. It's very actionable. Um, and part two of the book really is more focused for a different audience, the audiences that we'll be talking to over the next three days, which are more along the lines of policy, advocacy, and professionals who work in the ADU space. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up there and uh, hand it back to Kelly to ask any questions that she feels are appropriate to cover uh, some of the big topics we've talked about today. Great. Thank you. Um, so the first question that I wanted to bring up was um, regarding prefab units. Um, somebody asked, I'm interested in comparison between prefab ADU units and one built by contractors locally. Do you recommend um, any prefab companies? So I, I, don't, I know that maybe you're not aware of any local prefab companies, but I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about the comparison between those two options. Yeah, I mean, I, I tried to touch on that a little bit earlier. I won't, I won't go so far as to give a, a specific recommendation of an individual company, but I will say there's a lot of them out there in California. If you Google prefab ADU, you will be amazed um, at how many there are. Um, and there's a, I just did a podcast yesterday from a company that does nothing but prefab, um, kind of prefabricated modular units. Um, so I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that in too much more detail. I'll just say, you know, um, there's some reasons to consider prefab from a cost perspective and from a um, the construction timeline perspective. Those are probably the two main drivers. What you won't get with a prefab is exactly what you want. And there's oftentimes reasons why AD, um, prefabs don't really work on properties. That is to say, like, imagine you have a floor plan that the door is in one location and the windows in another, but where the door is it doesn't work with regard to the window orientation if you need to turn the door to be in the northeast portion of your lot. Or if you have a tree or something that you want to preserve, the prefab ADU just might, you might just not be able to find a floor plan that really works with your property. Um, but I, there's a lot of people who are initially interested in prefab in large part because of the the potential cost savings. I'll just say as a cautionary note, just be mindful of those additional costs that are not necessarily uh, included at the outset because they can't be, such as the foundation, permit costs, site plan costs, uh, surveys that you might have to do. So that sticker price that you see on their website is not gonna be necessarily, it, it'll be maybe less expensive in the end than a custom design build, but maybe not vastly less expensive. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Great. Next question is um, related to architects. Um, somebody mentioned that architects aren't necessarily required and I just wanted to ask what are the benefits of using an architect for my project and what are the alternatives to hiring an architect? I don't want to overstate my knowledge here, um, but I know, I know what the answer would be in Portland, um, but I don't know what the answer is in California. So I'll well, say in Portland, the answer would be um, an architect has a lot of value in understanding a lot of the things we've talked about today. Um, and furthermore, they have years and years of professional training in meeting all the code requirements and best practices for things like Title 24 um, <clears throat> that the average homeowner wouldn't know and really shouldn't be expected to know. And furthermore, California is a complicated environment to do development in general. So there's a lot of variables where having just experience is going to be extremely useful um, in terms of processing. For example, in COVID, uh, a homeowner is going to have a really hard time getting answers to their questions. So it would be advantageous to work with an architect who can answer those questions so that you don't have to rely upon the city to answer all your questions because it's going to be difficult to talk to a city official in person about your plans um, for a while. So there's a lot of benefits to using an architect in that regard. Uh, on the other hand, um, in the Portland market anyway, when I am doing like a really inexpensive ADU 
consultation, like a conversion of existing garage or attached interior carve out, I'll often advise homeowners not to use an architect, um, simply to save on the design fees, which might be upwards of $10,000 um, in order to uh, even go directly to a builder who can put together a set of simple plans because they don't have to do like, say the elevation drawings or the structural engineer drawings that a new construction might have to do. And so the, the onus, uh, the, the burden of the requirements might be significantly less for an internal conversion. And therefore you could probably circumvent using an architect, um, but that's not always the case. Um, and I'm sure there's others on the call who have a lot to say about this, but, I, but that would be my response for now. Great. Um, we had a, a couple of specific questions about legalizing existing structures. Um, somebody gave an example of an existing house um, that was permitted maybe 30 years ago that did not require sprinklers when built. And so would that mean that an attached ADU would also would, would require sprinklers or, hmm. um, or what would be the situation with that? And I think maybe just say a little bit more about um, about legalization of existing units? Well, this, the, the state has specific uh, guidance for, or I should say laws around legalizations of existing structures. And um, so and this is new legislation. They basically say jurisdictions must give a five year grace period for homeowners who want to legalize a pre existing unpermitted ADU. As I mentioned, there's a lot of unpermitted ADUs out there, um, and, and these are done to varying degrees of legality. Perhaps, for example, you could build out habitable living space with permits and then just have an illicit kitchen sink and stove, and there hasn't been, aside from that, there isn't any building code violations, so to speak, whereas there could also be um, converted basements that have no egress windows and weren't built with any permits whatsoever. So in theory, you shouldn't have anybody living down there because it's not in habitable living space. Um, and that's more of a violation. And furthermore, there might be, say, um, sheds that people are living in. And sheds are not, certainly not intended for habitable living space, but they also were never intended to be there to begin with. And so there's all, all these gradations of legality. But if the structure was permitted, the structure with the foundation, the structural shell, if that was permitted, then the legalization process shouldn't be too challenging. I mean, it, it will be challenging, but it won't be it won't be impossible. Whereas if it's, if the structural shell wasn't ever permitted to begin with, then it might be impossible to convert that to an ADU because the, the, the structural form wasn't allowed to have been there in the first place. So it's a difficult answer to give as a generic matter, but I'll just say that the state wants you to build an ADU, a legal permanent ADU, and jurisdictions are required to, um, allow you to in under certain conditions, as long as they're meeting de minimis like life safety standards. And that's not a very straightforward answer, but the state has your back to some extent. So I would look at HCD's guidance on this stuff and see what you can. And then, you know, ask your questions in an innocuous anonymous way of city planners to determine whether the structure itself was permitted to begin with. And if so, then you're in good standing to at least consider the idea of legalizing that un unpermitted um, dwelling into a permitted ADU. I hope that, hope that helps. I'm seeing that Supervisor Lopez um, raised his hand, so I'm just gonna oh. unmute him here. Sounds great. I'd love to just kind of jump in on that second question, which was about sprinklers. Uh, and I just want to share this because I heard Cole say this at the beginning of his presentation, which was know your laws. Because for me, when I went to build an ADU, I was a county supervisor. And I knew that there had been a law passed at the state level that said that if the original home didn't have sprinklers, I could not be required to put sprinklers in my ADU. And yet it was so new that staff wasn't aware of that. So I kept running into this, nope, you need to have sprinklers. And I knew what it would cost. And obviously water challenges are always an issue. And so I was able to go to that particular uh, senator, get a letter of his intent on the legislation and bring it back to staff and take it to the fire marshal. And they said, oh, you're right. We didn't know that, didn't know that existed. Thank you for your help. 
So knowing your laws and making sure that you advocate for yourself is critically important. And so I just wanted to once again reiterate that, po that point that Cole made at the beginning about knowing, knowing the laws being so important to the entire process. And so the more you're able to inform yourself as you go through it, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, the good, great points. Thanks, Chris. That's a, it's, that it, it's true, and um, it's unfortunate that we, you know, you're kind of like when you when you're taking on the how to be kind of an ADU developer, you're becoming a developer, and you kind of getting into this whole realm of series of expertises that you might not know anything about: planning and zoning regulations, financing, construction management, general contracting, Title Twenty Four. All this stuff is maybe all brand new to you. You've never rented a property before. Sorry, you've never been a landlord before. All these things are new. There's a lot to consider, not the least of which is this thing is going to be super expensive. How in the world do I get $200,000? And now we're saying you also have to know your laws because your city staff might not. So uh, this is not an easy thing, which is one reason why people might say, you know what, this is too much. I don't have the time or interest in doing this. I want to hire a design build company or a prefab company to handle all this stuff on my benefit. And I don't disparage anybody who makes that choice after hearing the complexities involved. Well, I think that's about how much we have time for in terms of questions. Um, but thank you so much, Cole, and thank you to Supervisor Lopez and Andy Flower for sharing your uh, localized knowledge as well. We really appreciate it. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about the upcoming workshops. Um, tomorrow from 10 to 12 a.m. we will have a workshop focusing on financing ADUs on coalition work related to promoting ADUs in Monterey County. Um, tomorrow evening from 4 to 6 p.m. we will have a workshop which is directed toward our building and design professionals who play a very important role in ADU development. And then on Friday we will have a workshop directed toward our city planning and building staff. Um, we're really excited to delve deeper into some of the intricacies around ADU development with Cole in these uh, workshops, which will be interactive, um, and so we hope that you'll join us. Um, and as many of you may be aware, United Way, Monterey County, uh, we've been working with partners to share best practices and collaborate for the promotion of ADUs in Monterey County through our ADU advisory group. So I just wanted to share that information and let you know if you're interested in learning more about our ADU initiative to check out our website, um, www.unitedwaymcca.org slash ADU dash initiative. Um, and while you're visiting our website, if you are a homeowner who is interested in building an ADU, I would encourage you to, to fill out our interested homeowner survey um, so that we can learn more about the barriers to ADU production in our county um, through your project. And if you are a homeowner who is in the midst of trying to build a, an ADU and would be interested in participating in um, by, by sharing your project as a case study, I would definitely encourage you to get in contact with us um, by reaching out to me um, and I'll put my information in the chat before we leave. But if you have any more questions, just feel free to contact me using um, the contact information that I'll provide. And just thank you to everyone and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks, Ben. It's been a lot of fun. Yay, good job, Kelly. Thanks. That was wonderful. Yeah, whoever is still on, um, yeah, let's un unvideo or show your videos. Um, I want to hear hear what you guys thought. So, you, Katie, you Let thought. Me just, um...